We've so far been looking at exponential growth and decay in situations where we either are growing from a state of zero, and then we go to go, or we're decaying to a state of zero, like radioactive decay. It's like eventually the whole substance, eventually, after billions of years, the thing will disappear. It'll be gone, right? So when you think about the exponential decay graph, what it's looking at, what it's looking like rather, is something like this with our asymptote right on the axis. We go down to zero, okay? But in a number of important situations, four of which I have on the board, and there are others that we'll get to explain later, there are various environmental factors that mean you don't go down to zero, okay? So, when we have a hot object, right, and you put it in an ambient temperature that is lower, or actually in reverse, if you've got a cold object, like, you know, you pull something out of the fridge, and you, it's summer, and it starts to warm up, right? That's going to change, the temperature of that object will change, not, you know, it's not going to go to zero, like, you're not going to, um, uh, take your cup of coffee out of the um, out of the microwave, and then it's not just going to go to zero degrees Celsius. It's like, oh, my frozen cup of coffee, right? It will come down to whatever the ambient temperature happens to be, right? So there's an environmental factor, which means it doesn't do this, yeah? Um, terminal velocity. If you throw an object from a great height, right, it's going to speed up, and it's going to speed up in a sort of exponential growth and decay kind of way. But it's not going to speed up forever. It's not going to speed up indefinitely. Terminal velocity means, if you relate, someone here with physics will help me, I think it's the force of gravity and drag and buoyancy. Buoyancy, like how, how buoyant the thing is. Once you put all those things together, there will be a certain speed which is like, it's your maximum speed. And it doesn't matter how much further you fall, that's the terminal velocity, right? Uh, if you have a population of something that's growing, right? There's a rate at which it's kind of like, okay, you've got um, people are dying, or animals are dying, at exactly the same rate as animals are being born. Yeah? So your mortality rate, your birth rate, they match out. Okay? But if you have just a little bit extra, it's like, oh, now we have the ability to you know, breed and grow our population faster than what's being lost through our, our you know, deaths in the population. So it's still exponential growth, but doesn't start or go towards zero. Uh, and then lastly, this is my attempt at drawing osmosis. You know how osmosis works, right? You've got high concentration and you've got low concentration, and that membrane is going to slow it down. It's not just going to diffuse, but eventually it will become diffuse, right? Now, how quickly does it diffuse? Well, the more the difference is between the concentrations, roughly speaking, I know there are other factors that I'm oversimplifying, but the more the difference is, then the faster the osmosis will happen. And at some point, the osmosis will stop when the difference between them is zero. Does that make sense when they have the same thing? So these environmental factors mean that our equations of exponential growth are ever so slightly different. So you do need this table now, so if you haven't got to the point where you've drawn it, go ahead and draw it. It's not going to be as involved as the previous one that you did about an hour ago. When we just think about normal growth and decay, okay, we have situations like this. You've got, uh, say, your population, and it's a e to the k t, and we of course know that if it were decay, what would be the difference? There'd be a single thing to change. Yeah, we just throw a minus sign in there, right? And then we get the, you know, it's dropping off because we reflected it horizontally. Okay. Now we looked at this just earlier. The differential equation, the equation that relates the derivative with the original population or mass or temperature or whatever, is going to be dp on dt being equal to what in this case? It's just going to be kp, right? Because you differentiate this, your, your inside derivative is k, and so it comes out the front, and then you just get p back with no other changes. Okay? And of course, just like we mentioned before, if it were decay, we just have a minus sign at the front. Okay? Now, what we have a look at, this is what the textbook calls it, which is not a very good name, because it's like, modify it. What does that mean? Um, this is a bit of a mouthful, that's why they prefer a brief title, but I prefer a descriptive one. The difference is you're going to have an extra number in here, like say we would call it m, it's just a constant that offsets your exponential growth or your exponential decay, right? So there's just an extra constant there that raises or lowers the graph, right? It generally raises, okay? Now, off on the side here, outside of the table, let's think about what kind of differential equation would result, because it's not going to be the same one. Different function should have a different differential equation. So let's come over here on the side. 
If I were to differentiate this modified equation, not a trick question, what would the derivative be? What happens to the capital M? It's a constant, so it goes. When you differentiate, it's gone. Okay. But what you then get left with is this guy over here, which will be k a. times, yeah, a e to the k t, almost everything you had before. Okay. Now, if I then say, hmm, if I factor out that k, and this is going to seem a bit weird what I'm about to do, but I'm trying to get it in terms of the differential equation. I'm trying to get it in terms of this initial, this, this initial equation. Okay. If what I do is I add n and then take n away, let me say that again. If you add n and then take it away, there's no net change, right? Do you agree that these two equations are the same? No change. But the reason why I add it and then take it away is because have a look at this part here. What is that? That's your equation, that's your original function for the population or mass or temperature or whatever you're dealing with, right? So therefore, if I replace that with P, I now have a differential equation, like so, which relates the derivative with the original function, right? I've got my k out the front, and instead of just having p, I've got p take away m. That's it. Okay? So you see this constant here, just make that a slight difference. It's not, oops, it is. It's not a lot more complicated, uh, but it does give you different situations, you can understand. Question. You just um, take n to the other side and you'll have p minus n equals a. It'll be exactly the same. Like doing that, that adding and subtracting thing is exactly the same as what you just said. If you're happy with that, then that's fine. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a quick example of this. The first one actually that I did up the front, uh, and it gets a special name because it gets used so often. So physics people know all about what, who, which, which physicists do we name this after when we have cooling objects. We call it Newton's law of cooling. Okay. So if you want, you can put a little. Uh, uh, a little subheading over this example we're about to do, which is Newton's law of cooling. It's worth pointing out that if you have a hot object and you put it in a cool environment, it's a law of cooling. But if, the if you do the reverse, right? If you take a, a cool object, like a frozen object, and then you put it out the room temperature, it will thaw in exactly the same way. Okay? So, I've given you some facts here. Let's fill this information in because I didn't want any spoilers. If it's a 20 degree day, okay, so if 20 degrees was the ambient temperature, 20 degrees uh, in normal space, and suppose you boil some water, you boil some water, and after five minutes of cooling, you pour it into a cup, it was a boiling cup of water, you pour it into a cup, and after five minutes, it hits 70 degrees, so it's cooled down substantially, okay, after five minutes. Um, two questions, and these exponential growth questions always begin like this. You're going to be required to prove that a particular function is going to satisfy the relevant differential equation. So prove that this will satisfy. Now, <laughs> I've alluded to this, Mrs. Lee's has as well. In situations where you're dealing with temperature and time, temperature and time both start with T, but we use T anyway. So I've got capital T the temperature, and little t, as we've been using for quite some time now, uh, little t for time. For time. Okay. So yes, that means my differential equation will have dt on dt, and then just deal with it, you'll be fine. Okay, now, what are we going to get? What's my equation? Okay, so our first part, which we're going to do in a second, is to prove that this function will satisfy this differential equation. We're going to do that in a second. And then the real question is, okay, well, how long then, if that's how long it took to get to 70 degrees, how long will it take to get down to 25 degrees? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, yeah, minus k. Okay, minus k? It is, it's decay, right? Yeah, there's a minus k. Thanks, Harry. I should rewrite that because it would be easier to read for all of them. Minus k. Okay, so let me just reset that one more time now that it's written more comfortably. Let's prove that this function satisfies this differential equation, we'll prove that. And then secondly, let's find out how long is it going to take, uh, how many minutes, whatever, to get to this target temperature. Okay. 